Holland Temple family. My name is Sarah Flack. I'm the superintendent of the Sunday School. I want to welcome you to our Youth Department Christmas program. It's going to be a little bit different this year because it's going to be all virtual. The children have worked really hard in putting this on for you, so I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you. And Evergreen has a very appropriate name. It is Evergreen, always green. It does not become dormant in the winter as most other trees do. The color green represents new life. It symbolizes our everlasting life with Jesus Christ. We should be as the evergreen tree, always full of life, never becoming dormant in our life with Christ. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven. He gives life to the world. John chapter 6, verse 33. Cookies. Making cookies is a favorite pastime for most families during the Christmas season. Cookie cutters are used to turn ordinary cookie dough into edible masterpieces. God doesn't use any cookie cutters when he creates each one of us. He makes every one of us so special and unique that he would have to break the mold after just one use. He is the potter and we are his clay. He wants to mold us into his masterpieces. We only need to be moldable and willing to follow his lead. Behold, like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 6. Ornaments are used to decorate Christmas trees each and every year. People look for the perfect ones to fit on their tree. Our Christmas tree just wouldn't seem complete without our ornaments. Ornaments symbolize the blessings in our lives. Our lives just wouldn't be complete without God's blessings. Everything, everything that we have is due to God loving us so much that He wants to shower us with His blessings. Just as ornaments are all different shapes and sizes, blessings are all different as well. God picks and chooses each blessing for us so that there, so that it will be just right. The next time you decorate your tree and as you put up each ornament, think of a blessing that God has given you. I think you'll find that you run out of ornaments before you run out of blessings. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Deuteronomy 16 and 17. The wreath has evergreen branches bent into a circle so that ends touch, so that the ends touch, having no beginning or ends, just as there is no beginning or end of Jesus' eternal love for us. Just as the wreath looks the same throughout and seems to not change, so his word will always be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Sanctify them. Set them apart for holy service to God in the truth. Your word is the truth. That's John 17, 17. The bell rings out to guide lost sheep back to the fold, signifying that all are precious in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus is our shepherd, and he laid down his life for us, that we may spend eternity with him in heaven. He is calling us to follow him through his word. Are you going to listen? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? That's Matthew 18 and 12. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That was John 10 and 11. These days the world has forgotten the reason for Christmas. Most people seem to think that getting presents is the greatest thing about Christmas. Most people seem to think that presents have nothing to do with Christmas. Well, they are both wrong. The wise men came to visit Jesus as a young child and gave him presents. They gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They offered him gold as a king, paying him tribute, frankincense as God, for they honored God with the smoke of incense and myrrh. As a man that should die for myrrh was used in embalming dead bodies. These men, these wise men, saw this baby and knew that he is king, is God, and that he would die for the sins of the world. 
How can anyone with the knowledge that we have now not believe? There they saw the child with his mother, Mary. They bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures. They gave him incense and myrrh. The Gospel according to Matthew, second chapter, verse 11. Many people spend hours wrapping all of their presents during Christmas time. They use ribbons, garland, and bows to make sure that their presents are as beautiful as possible. What they don't realize is that the items that they use to complete the outside of the gift have more meaning than the actual gift inside. The bow ties our present with a beautiful ribbon, just as Jesus ties us as Christians together in his love. We may not be in the same family, but we are all in the family of God. Jesus is the ribbon that binds us together. And above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. We see holly as decorations during the Christmas season, but do we really understand what holly stands for? The leaves represent the crown of thorns that were placed upon Jesus' head as he was being crucified. The berries symbolize the blood that he shed for us. He endured criticism, excruciating pain, and embarrassment, all for you and I. The next time you see a decoration with holly on it, remember what was done for you so that he could spend eternity with you. I know that I will. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail the King of the Jews. Matthew chapter 27, verse 29. When a room is full of darkness, it is dark. But if you light a single match in the room, the room is light. There may be more darkness in the room, but the light overpowers it. We can be that light. We can be a single light in a world of darkness. You can share that light so that the light increases. You are the light of the world. A city on hope can be hidden. Nor do people light a lamb and put it under a basket, but put it on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. Imagine you're a lowly shepherd watching your sheep. This night seems no different than any other. Then, all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord is in the sky above you, telling you of the Savior's birth. You, a shepherd? Why did God send an angel to tell shepherds? Because the message that God had about the birth of Jesus was for all people, not just for the rich, not just for the Jew, everyone. God chose his number one messenger to tell the lowest of people in the world's eyes of his son's birth. God looks at the heart, not what the world looks at. Thank goodness. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's the gospel according to Luke chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. A candy cane symbolizes multiple things. If you hold it upright, it looks like a shepherd's crook. The shepherds were one of the few people who were able to hold baby Jesus in Bethlehem. If you turn the candy cane upside down, it looks like a J. Jesus starts with a J. The colors of the candy cane are also symbolic. The red represents the blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross, and the white represents the purity of Jesus. These are candy canes with three small red stripes running around it. These stripes symbolize the Trinity, God, the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit. Who knew this delicious, simple candy was so profoundly symbolic of our Lord Jesus Christ in a simple birth? And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. The star is a heavenly sign of prophecy fulfilled ages ago, the shining hope of all mankind. The star led the wise men to find the baby Jesus. These wise men traveled many miles following the star in the sky. The star was their guiding light to the Savior. God was the wise men's travel agent in his hordes, leading them to the greatest destination known to man, the Savior. 
We now have his word as our guiding light to lead us to be with him in heaven. Are you going to follow him? And behold, the star of wisdom sang in the east went before them. Till a star to where a young child was. Christmas is for giving and for showing that we care, for honoring the Christ child with the loving gifts we share. The wise men gave of riches, the shepherds faith and love. Each gift in its own measure was smiled on from above. Let every gift be treasured, not always size or price, determines the extent of love and willing sacrifice. Handsome gifts with festive trim bring smiles of sweet content, but modest gifts of humble means are oftentimes heaven sent. Whether it be large or small, each gift will share in part the message of true Christmas joy if given from the heart. Guard in my heart this Christmas. Even though this Christmas we must spend apart, you're still right here with me because I keep you in my heart. So picture me there beside you, sitting by the twinkling tree, and rest assured next Christmas you'll truly be spending it with me. Christmas is more than a day in December. It's all of those things that we love to remember. It's carolers singing familiar refrains, bright colored stockings and shiny toy trains, streamers of tinsel and glass satin balls, laughter that rings through the house and its halls. Christmas is more than a day in December. It's the magic and the love that we'll always remember. I hope everyone enjoyed our Christmas program, although it was virtual. I think the kids did an excellent job, and I hope you feel the same way. But I do want to give special thanks to Ms. Cheryl Dudley, who put this all together. She worked very hard, and I really do appreciate all her efforts. And I just want to say thank you, Cheryl, for such an excellent job. So boys and girls, our scripture lesson for this week can be found in the Gospel according to Luke, the second chapter, verses 1 through 7. And it reads as follows. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea in Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of of and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. May, in the end. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and most importantly, those who live by the Word of God. Today, boys and girls, I want to talk to you about Jesus, the gift that just keeps on giving. All right? Amen. So I know you all have to be incredibly excited with it being Christmas time and all of the gifts that you guys are going to have delivered to you on Christmas Day. I got a few gifts here inside uh, my stocking here today. But uh, as we get excited about the gifts that we're going to get under our Christmas tree this year, we also have to be mindful and remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. And Jesus was the greatest gift that we've ever been given in any of our lives, God gave us the gift of his son, Jesus. And often this time of the year, we read and tell about the story that I just read for you, which is the birth of Jesus. The reason why we celebrate Christmas is because Christmas is Jesus' birthday, so we're celebrating his birth. But oftentimes, we, we know that Jesus was born to Mary, and we hear about the Immaculate Conception and all of those sorts of things. But I think sometimes we underappreciate exactly what God did for us when he came down from heaven and took on the body of a little child and grew up to become the man that we know as Jesus so that he could come down here and be with us and repair the relationship 
that we had lost with God when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. So to give you guys a little better perspective and understanding of exactly what God did when he came down and took on the form of a little child, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an exercise here and something to think about. So I want you to imagine for a minute that you've got a goldfish in a bowl in your house, just like the goldfish that you're seeing on your screen right now. And you have to communicate some kind of a message to this goldfish, whether it's time for him to eat, whether he's in some kind of danger, or perhaps maybe that you're about to take him on some kind of a trip that he needs to prepare for. But you've got to communicate this message to the fish, and you've got to communicate it to him in a way that he can understand the message that you're trying to tell him. So I want you to take just about Oh, 30 seconds here and think about what are some ways that you would try to communicate your message, whatever that message it is, to the goldfish in the bowl. Let's take a minute and think about it. All right, so did you put your best thinking cap on? What did you come up with? Well, I'm sure some of you probably came up with things like, maybe I might write a note and hold it up to the bowl. But that's assuming that the fish can read and that he can understand English. Maybe you might say that maybe I might kind of try to act out some gestures and maybe press my face up against the bowl and, 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 and maybe try to mouth some words and hope that the, the fish might be able to understand me. Or maybe I might point to a, 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 a bottle of food that I plan to sprinkle into the, into the fish bowl. And you could try all of those things and maybe the fish might get the message. But once again, you got to guess that he would understand the gestures that you're making and, the, and, and even the sounds and noises that you might be making with your face pressed up against the bowl. But I wonder how many of you thought about becoming a fish to communicate with the fish. Anybody think about that? Anybody think about fish have their way of communicating with each other. I'm sure they understand each other. So how many of you thought maybe I'll just turn myself into a fish and get down in the bowl with the fish to make sure that I can communicate with them the message that I need for them to understand. Well, when you think about it like that, boys and girls, we can understand a little bit better what God did for us. See, we're kind of like that goldfish in a bowl, and God is kind of like us trying to communicate that message to the goldfish. There are times where God had important messages and things that he wanted to communicate with us, but it seemed like there was a communication deficit. Maybe we really weren't quite understanding or getting a clear picture of what it was that God was trying to communicate with us. So God figured, well, if there's a message that I really want my creations, my people to understand, maybe it's best if I became like them, if I became a part of them. Maybe if I came down from heaven and dwelled with them and taught them my messages and spoke to them on a level that they could understand, maybe they would get the message a little bit clearer. So God, as big and infinite as he was, chose to shrink himself down into the form of a little baby and be born just like you and I were born and grow up just like we grew up so that eventually he could teach us the message that he wanted us to understand. Now just imagine for a minute turning yourself into a fish. Most of us probably wouldn't want to do that, right? Especially when we're out here in the big world with everything that we've got to enjoy. None of us would look forward to shrinking ourselves down to the size of a fish and then going inside of a little bowl and let alone having to swim around in water, a completely different environment to what we're used to. Most of us probably wouldn't want to do that, even if it meant communicating a message to the fish that might save them from getting flushed down the toilet one of these days. 
But that's essentially what God did. He essentially did what we would find uncomfortable. Basically shrinking yourself down, going into a completely different environment from the big infinite universe that God is used to occupying himself in to condense himself down to a human form, to communicate to you and I, to save us. We're not going to get flushed down the toilet, but, but certainly God saved us from the wrath that was to come from us not being able to get to heaven because of sin. So he came down to save us from sin so that we might have a chance to get into heaven. So the next time you want to think about what Jesus did on Christmas by coming into the form of a baby, coming out of heaven and taking on the form of a baby, I want you to think about what it would be like if you had to shrink yourself down and become like that goldfish to get your message across to him. Because that's essentially what God did for us. Makes us think a little bit differently about the whole birth story, doesn't it, around Christmas, and makes us appreciate a little bit more what God was willing to go through to make sure that his message to us was clear. I'm sure you guys are going to be getting some great gifts for Christmas, but don't forget that the birth of Jesus is the greatest gift of all, and it's the gift that keeps on giving to us every day, even unto eternal life. Merry Christmas, boys and girls. I hope you have a great holiday. And remember to keep Jesus first because he's the reason for the season. In the name of the triune God, may the spirit of Christian mission enter in every heart. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.